Okay, we're back here at KEXU 96.1 FM. Welcome to Poor People's Revolution Radio Special Zoom Series. You can find us at 96.1 FM on the dial right here in Oakland and streaming on www.poormagazine.org slash radio. And I am the Black Cripple in your face. And who is I? Who is this? Who's my co-host? And I'm the poverty scholar, that houseless mama, that houseless daughter. All the poverty scholar, all those people you don't want to see, never want to be, look away from me. What you going to do? Arrest me. We're in your city. Yeah. Welcome to From Katrina to Corona. Poor and indigenous people led solutions to poverty and COVID-19 versus government politrickster solutions and hypocrisy. So we're going to start with a short uh, cut from our brother Malik Rahim. For those of you who don't know, is uh, actually coming out of Louisiana. Uh, Poor Magazine had the blessing of speaking and sitting with that elder who went through the actual Katrina uh, back in the day of that genocide that our politricksters waged on black and poor people of Louisiana. Um, so he's going to just, we're just going to do a quick minute from him and then we'll be having a little bit more later in the show uh, from Brother Malik, and then actually in future shows in the next few weeks, we'll be having him on live. So I am going to be sharing this screen, which I hope I can figure out. Hold on, because my digitally divided ass Hello. is not the best. So hold on one sec. Here we go. <sighs> Hold on, we're having technical difficulties. Hold on, family. I know you can barely hear it. Hold on, if I can get some of this closed. Please stand by as we correct the problem. <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Now it's muted. Can you go backwards? Yeah, yeah can you start all over? Yeah, I'm going to start all over again. And here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Magazine, oh, and we're here in New Orleans, and Al Jazeera's, and we're here with Malik Rahim. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, you know, Malik is in Tony for years. Come to New Orleans, come to New Orleans. So we're here, and we want to, you know, talk to you that interview is a conversation, you know, just talking. Yeah, I, I want to go back. I want to go back. People know about your activism and your black cancers and, you know, common ground. But I want to go back to your youth. I want to, I want to see, you know, where did you, where were you born? You know, how did you get into activism as a youth? You know? Oh, man. That's, mm. uh, I'm 70, I'll be 71 mm. in December. And uh, I was raised in a community that was once known as Freetown. Freetown. Okay. It was uh, it was established in uh, in 1850, but it was a community that was made of uh, not only. Uh, 
slaves or ex-slaves, but also maroons. So it had a, a large maroon history. Uh, and it was, what, 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 what I mean, it was, yeah. Well, you know, a maroon is a, a, is a runaway. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. There was basically two types of maroons in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. There was a grand maroon and a petty maroon. Okay. Uh, a petty maroon was a maroon, a, a slave that ran away uh, just to find a loved one, but had no intention on staying uh, gone. Mm -hmm. And then it was a grand maroon. And a grand maroon was a, a slave that, uh, that that ran away and had no intentions on on uh, on going back. Mm -hmm. All right, to live in a life of a slave is okay. one that uh, that uh, that that would say, "I would rather die in, in the bayou than to live a life of a slave." Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, the grand with your grand maroons. It's the oldest African community in Louisiana. So uh, again, that's the community that I was raised in. And then uh, I was raised in the in a community. I don't know if you're familiar with Queen Mother Moore. You think I am? All right, but Queen Mother Moore came from out of New Iberia, but it was all on the West Bank. It had a strong uh, Garvinite uh, community, mm -hmm. and prior to that, it had a strong Bishop Henry Turner. Uh, both was uh, individuals that was uh, that led movements and you know back to Africa. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a you know, it's a community that uh, that played a major role in the Battle of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, it played a major role in in the establishment of not only uh, Liberia, but also mm -hmm. Sierra Leone, okay. you know, and uh, uh, also uh, Belize. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is a community that's, that's uh, even though it's, it's, uh, it's a local one, you know, that have played a major role. Even in the, in the completion of the Panama Canal, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, you know, uh, when, when the French uh, sold the Panama Canal to the We're going to stop there just because we want to make sure we have time for our guests and for today's topic, but we're going to continue to be um, playing more and later in this broadcast and then in future weeks. This is all uh, powerful words from poverty scholar and liberator Malik Rahim from Common Ground. For those of you who don't know, Louisiana uh, is, and Common Ground was ground zero of the uh, politicking and the genocide waged on specifically poor people and black people in the Ninth Ward, uh, where Malik is still today and will not and w will never give up resistance. Yeah, and we, and we have to say that, you know, Malik is, you know, is fighting to keep his house. So, exactly. you know, if people can, um, you know, support him, um, you know, you know, give your support to Poor Magazine and we can pass it on to Malik because he's still paying his house. Exactly. Because it's typical, never got any reparations, support, or remuneration for uh, the, literally, as he points it, one, uh, thousands of people that he saved and his community saved on their own mm -hmm. without no politicsters. So I say all that to say, uh, today's show, moving in that perfect, frightening direction, is focused on our own politrickster right here in this occupied village of Wichin, that's Mayor Oakland. Yeah, none other than Mayor Libby Schaff. Uh, plan to gentrify Oakland streets under the cover of COVID-19. Do not get it twisted. This was already on the books, but we can slip this kind of shit by by calling it uh, corona or COVID-19, uh, you know, uh, plans, right? And so we already know, and to introduce tonight's theme, 
we will be presenting an excerpt because we all poets and cultural workers too. And there's more than one way, as my mama D said, to send a message. And we all, of course, are blessed to have some powerful folks like Iodeli Wordslinger, uh, Jeremy, yeah. and Gerald Smith, who are going to get into this with us. But Iodeli is, in fact, also an amazing poet. So how blessed is that? But we're going to start with a quick excerpt of our theater and our action resistance project we call Gentrification Tours Are Us. We, the people, communities of color, workers, migrants, grandfathers, grandmothers, mamas, daddies, elders, babies, young folks, indigenous ancestors, aboriginal people who have spent time, love, and sweat, and tears, praying, caring for, working, dreaming, loving this community, this barrio, this tree, this hood. This tree, this garden, this flower, this for generations, centuries, and time beyond the land, missionary calendars. Who have been displaced by the forces of money, power, and real estate, snake speculation, corporate theft, corporate government, philanthropimping, mm. redevelopment, and gentrification, and now only exists as a cultural memory an artifact, a reference, a brush stroke, a photo, an exhibit, a dream to be studied, theorized, painted over, documented and or forgotten and erased completely as though we were never here. Gentrification tours are us, exist to document the theft, reclaim and take back the stolen spaces, memories, image, pictures, lives, and dreams. To tour and document the default Dick colonizers and 21st century missionaries. The race, the colonize, the cultural, the cultural stealers to reinsert our stolen, this stolen landmark and to reclaim what little of us might still be left. Gentrification tours are us. Coming soon to a displaced gentrified neighborhood near you. Thank you, everybody. So, gentrification tours are us is a theater and production. Us po poets at Poor Magazine created as we are all gentrification. Survivors in our series and art is our life. Yeah, so tonight we're getting a little bit into this redunculi called Slow Streets. Again, remembering that these plans were on the politricsters' hands long before COVID-19, but actually from the other deadly virus called poverty. Um, and so basically, you know, stealing giant swaths of Oakland, specifically and most intensely East Oakland. That's right here where homefulness is, right here on an intentionally blighted uh, poor people of color neighborhood that is in fact the next frontier of the settler colonial genocide known as gentrification. Um, our youth scholars at Decolonize Academy and Poor Magazine have done multiple research studies. That's poor people-led research. Can, uh, finding out along with my brother D and my brother Montiado and Leroy and so many more that these mysterious fires that have taken down our black owned businesses right here on Black Arthur, uh, that now just an empty lot sits that literally swaths and swaths of East Oakland are just gated up, but definitely not for sale. They're owned by culture vultures and snakes who are waiting until the property values mm. go up so they can flip them. These are words that they use, right? Not us. And so to get into this moment, we were blessed to have um, in this crazy Zoom moment, uh, a powerful warrior, an author, a cultural worker, a playwright, uh, Iodeli word slanger, a community organizer, and powerful revolutionary Gerald Smith, um, revolutionary Poor Magazine family and organizer Jeremy Miller, 
and I see so many of our other folks here too. A uh, shout out to Jonathan Gomez, to Greg Barton, and we hope you stay with us to get into this too. But we're going to start with our beautiful sister warrior, Ayodeli Wordslanger, to kind of lay out the situation. Please take it away. Well, slow streets were announced as part of a Zoom town hall held by Libby Schaff and the city uh, in their COVID updates. Mm. And they started Easter weekend. They were announced with a map that is an artifact from a bike lane update that existed in 2019. And the mm. word update would say that this was a plan that existed prior to 2019. And speaking to some people, they can track the history of, of bike lobbies in Oakland back to 1999. So the proposal is to slow some streets. According to Dan Kalb from uh, District One, Rebecca Kaplan, and Libby Shaft, this is a plan that is related to COVID, mm -hmm. to create safe streets for people to socially distance on. Mm -hmm. Half of the streets are in East Oakland. One of the remaining two of the original four closures is in West Oakland. One is in North Oakland, and I spoke to some people who live in North Oakland, and it remains to be seen what difference it'll make there. They've got bike lanes there. They're heavily used bike lanes. It's a residential district. Everybody is home. And so those people were already walking out into the street with the heavy bike lanes. Mm. On, West Oak, in a, on West Street, there are no bike lanes there. There are no bike lanes on the narrow Plymouth Street in East Oakland. However, there are visible markers that indicate that perhaps Plymouth Street is intended to turn into a bike only street. So it is this actually related to COVID? Because if it's related to COVID, then why is it informed by bicycle lanes? Where is the data that say proposed bicycle lanes need to be slowed so that people don't um, infect each other from COVID. It uh, seems to be, <laughs> it's, it, it seems to be rather yeah. count, uh, counter indicative yeah. of being told to shelter at home and in your own neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. hard to understand whether people are being invited to come in to slow streets because that's a good place to exercise. And then there's the cultural thing of, are there a lot of people who are jogging on Plymouth Street <laughs> in East Oakland? Um, is there a high demand for the people who live there who are people of color, that they have more space in which to exercise in the middle of the street? So it sets the basis for one to wonder how a city like Oakland that has a problem with intersectionality manages to roll out a program that involves Oakland Police Department, mm. the Department of Transportation, the Department of Public Works, the Department of Parks and Recs, with the mayor's blessing and with Kaplan's blessing. Kaplan wanted in 2019 to fire Ryan Russo and to roll the Department of Transportation back into public works. The Department of Transportation came into being about the same time the Department of Race and Equity did in Oakland. So it is interesting to see a new department have so much uh, support in implementing its projects. The Department of Race and Equity hasn't done quite so well. It is not implemented its um, guiding directive that everything in Oakland should be done with equity in mind for everybody. Oh. 
those closures, it's, it's interesting. It's COVID. Again, if half the districts are in East Oakland, where's the data? Policy turns on data and policy requires money to implement it. Thank you. So where is that money coming from? Is that to be recouped out of COVID disaster funds? Mm. Is that why we've connected the implementation of bicycle lanes to COVID? Mm. I mean, I can think of some other things we could do with that money. Thank you. So that's yeah. slow streets. You, I, I, I've tried to in, inquire with the Department of Transportation. Um, I've reached out to Ryan Russo. Ryan Russo passed me off to his assistant, Sean Mayher. We gonna name names because these are the people who are responsible for doing outreach and keeping us informed. Thank you. And Mr. Mayer informed me that Mr. Russo was a bit busy, but he would answer all of the questions I had. My inquiries went in about five days ago. I have yet to hear anything back from the Department of Transportation, although they have plenty of time to post uh, uh, their positive uh, effects on street blog. Yep. So Thank that's you. slow streets. Ashe. Thank you. I um, Thank you. Let's bring in Gerald. Okay. Um, go for it, Gerald. And we got each person like laying out the beginning, like about five, six minutes, and then we're going okay, to. Okay. Okay. You want real quick. Well, real quick, just want to go back to, what is this? July 23rd of 2016. That's when, you know, I live out here in East Oakland, right on 73rd. Some crazy Negro shot at the police on, uh, in front of a liquor store, Arab liquor store. And, and, you know, the police feel they, they surrounded the whole neighborhood and had their little dragnet and all that bullshit in vain, unable to come up with anything. So they wasn't going to just stop. Look, some Negro had to pay. Somebody shot at the police. Some Negro got to go to jail. So they, they, they picked a family with a history of political activism in this area, and that is Fahima's family. And the way they came was, was what was messed people up. They came with the armored personnel vehicle and dressed in the, it was Homeland Security. It was not the Oakland Pigs. The Oakland Pigs picked the house. Homeland Security came with all this military hardware, um, uh, flashbang, the front door and the back door. When they busted the door open, they came in with the robots and all. All right. They dogged these folks. And made them come out in their damn bed clothes and drawers and shit. It was some sick shit. But understand why I insist it was sick. It was sick because the Arab man who they took the, the film footage from, if you saw the film footage, it was clearly not Omar because Omar's dreads was past his waist. Mm. Whoever it was that took the shot, which they saw had, had dreads that were above his waist. And therefore, there's no possibility that you can make that kind of mistake, okay? They just felt that one of us had to pay. So they went to these political folks. They, they, they woke them up in the, you know, early, early in the morning, didn't have no warrant. All right, folks call me. I got the Oscar Grant Committee involved. People in the community started helping. We got a lawyer for the family. It's kind of sad, you know what I mean? But Thursday, they caught the mother. They caught the uh, person who had shot at the police. So one would think, okay, they done caught the person that shot at the police. Let's let Omar, oh, it's all good. The return to bail, any nothing. They didn't drop no charge or nothing because they knew goddamn well we was gonna sue them. That it was likely that we would take legal action against them. <laughs> so, stop laughing. I'm trying to do right. So anyway, thank you very much. Oh, so that gives the background for who Fahima is. Fahima called me as soon as she saw this stuff. Basically, but her subjective experience you understand is this armored personnel vehicle coming to her house mm -hmm. which fortunately the neighbors took you know everybody got cameras now your phone is a camera so we had plenty of footage we made little videos about this etc etc 
So when she she said the same thing that Aya Delhi said about there ain't no there ain't nobody jogging out here and ain't nobody riding no damn bike. What what's up with this? So immediately the way she is reasoning, and I happen to agree with her on this, that when they come up with some stuff like this, okay, they can say, well, we think it's a nice idea for everybody <laughs> not to be in the street in your own fucking neighborhood. I'm sorry, in your own neighborhood. Yeah, well, obviously brothers and sisters don't even read the papers because we can't afford them. They don't communicate with us. So they put up a couple of little, a little, um cones and shit and you're supposed to know what that means well the next step is who who's gonna tell you that you can't walk down the street in your neighborhood yeah porky yep. i mean i'm the the police officers most That's likely right. will inform the community of their restriction what if a brother say man what the fuck you talking about man get on away from me i ain't bothering you <laughs> bang yeah and that's that's what we think even even though they lie, if you go to the website, which we did, I read the website, and, and I want to quote to you what they say in the website, and then you'll understand why we feel the way we do. Give me one second, please. In the website, oh, shit. City of Oakland. Okay, so they we already, the sister already explained where the these bike lanes, so-called bike lanes are going to be. Then they say, what Oakland slow streets does, and then they say what Oakland slow streets doesn't do. Underline, right? Well, it doesn't. They're not gonna give out no tickets. They're not gonna. Yeah, all. You know what? This would not be the first time that we were lied to. Okay, oh. because in fact, at some point, and they and they're very vague. Um, Ayadeli was correct also. They're very vague about if and when this thing should ever end. Is this a permanent structural change to the city or not? They do not provide that information. Yeah. So given, and, and I immediately started calling people and saying, look, this is what's happening. And we think this is not good. Now I'm not tripping. I don't hate white people, but I do understand distinctions in consciousness and experience. So the people that I talked to said, oh, gee, calm down, man. It's, you know, they, it's just a little bullshit. They, it's stupid, obviously. It don't make no sense. But, you know, and it's harmless. That's because in their lived experience, they don't know people that have been murdered by the police. Yeah. They don't have people in their family that done been falsely arrested, beat up, taken down the police. That, that kind of, they don't have that relationship with law enforcement. So I'm not not that I'm not gonna stop trying, but that was my first attempt. And I believe that is the right attempt that we have to communicate to people that we know. I think we have to write something that is clear, factual, and that explains the negative consequences that are possible with this so-called slow street. See, there is a problem. You gotta understand. I ain't talking bad about Negro, but Negro do be driving fast out here. Now that's, that's come on now. Let's, let's just be real with each other. And that is a legitimate concern. But when they start talking about safe, they are a lot of white people done moved out here. I know y'all, maybe y'all don't notice it, but a lot of white people are either bought houses or rented houses out here. Yep. And they talking about, oh, I'm a prisoner in my own house. I'm scared to go out. So what make them motherfuckers, I'm sorry. What makes those citizens feel um, safe? Exactly. And the objective reality may not be the same thing. Y'all laughing at me. I'm trying not to be cussing. No, me no, no. So anyway, that's, so I believe our task is the following. One, we have to educate our community. Somebody needs to write something short, but clear about the potential dangers. And then this is the work. The sister had already explained, she tried to communicate with the, with the authorities. And, um, and what did they, nothing. They didn't even call her back. So we have to knock on their door. Oh. The next time they have any kind of a city council meeting or any kind of meeting affecting this, we should pay them a visit. And watch our mouths, don't be like me. You know, I mean, I'm not the model. I'm gonna try to help, but I, I and I want to do better. 
But we should point out some of these things that sister said and that I'm trying to say, because yes, they terrorize us all the time. You know, even when there's a, a fist fight out here in East Oakland, you see 20 fucking cop, 20 cop cars. That's right. So people may feel some fear of the police themselves. And I think we have a responsibility to at least try to organize our community to resist the negative impacts of this potential program. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gerald. We're gonna go to Jer Jeremy. Jeremy, take it away. Well, first, I want to I want to give mad appreciation to the uh, truth tellers that are uh, they're here on this uh, uh, Zoom experience uh, uh, with me. This is really important um, that, that 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 this is brought to light because uh, one of the things that uh, that that I've I've been uh, observing uh, quite clearly is in this declared state of emergency and and yes of course there is a a, a quite dangerous and deadly uh, uh infectious disease going around so not not in any way trying to be dismissive of that reality but in the midst of this um in the midst of this i what i've observed is is a lot of jack moves happening you know to 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 to, to be real with it a lot of jack moves happening a lot of politricsters uh using this as a pretext, right, to to push forward uh, uh, violent and sometimes, uh, depending on what group of people you're talking about, genocidal maneuvers uh, that they already had in the works for maybe uh, uh, over a decade or more in time, and they're using this as a as a pretext for that. And everything that uh, that uh, brother Gerald spoke on, uh, that sister Ayadeli spoke on, this this all plays into this and I find this to be a really important phenomenon to uh, to look at because you know uh, uh, people have been comment the, the commentariat has been commenting left and right about there been these um, kind of right wing uh, tea party esque people uh, in different places in the country protesting about their their, their their liberties and whatnot and hanging out like thousands together and everyone's been making fun of them right and granted it doesn't seem like the healthiest maneuvers in the world, right, being right up on top of each other with an infectious disease going around. But there's a piece of this that they actually, as, 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 as much as I hate to be aligned in any way, shape, or form with people that think Saddam Hussein and Barack Obama are related, uh, 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 there's a piece of this that they, that they have correct, and that is that there are a lot of scamming politicians that are putting out a bunch of BS and hiding it behind this coronavirus thing, and, and, and so as, as much as, as we need to keep our, our mind on, 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 you know, things like science, <laughs> right, uh, um, it's, it's, it's critical that we don't let these scam artists get away with attacking our communities uh, uh, using this as an excuse. And, and to, 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 to um, you know, uh, you're talking about the slow streets, you know, We've had similar things in, uh, in here. I'm, I'm coming uh, off the uh, semi-fictional semi-island of San Francisco, California. And, and, and here, you know, we've had similar ludicrous maneuvers uh, done in the name of, um, of uh, 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 safety for the corona, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the coronavirus. And things like, like on, uh, I believe it was March 29th, uh, uh, the uh, CEO here, London Breed, decided to order that uh, all, all stores less than uh, 5,000 square feet have to close at 8 p.m. Well, okay, first off, first off, what exactly makes a larger store, like say a safe, Safeway or Walgreens, where more people can congregate together, safer? Two, two, in many neighborhoods, the Tenderloin comes in particular to mind, people who have been previously ordered to shelter in place do not have a major grocery store uh, close close by to go to. So this is actually a lifeline, especially if you start thinking about disabled people, becomes even more so. And, and so there's all these, these policies. Now, now, who does that benefit, though? Whose bottom line does that benefit? That benefits the online retailers, Amazon and the ilk. It benefits Safeway and Walgreens and all the big box stores that have been trying to get a greater foothold and have all the money for lobbying power. You know, so these things are happening, you know, not, not to side joke, but these things are happening all over the place. We have to push back on them to touch on where the money comes from. Uh, um, well, 
two things. I'll touch on the money and I'll touch on the safety thing. The touch on where the money comes from that, that Sister Iadeli, uh, Iadeli brought up. Well, I think a lot of these things, there, there, there is a gentrification master plan for the Bay Area. And it's been it's been in a, it's been an, uh, uh, a a discernible effective form since at least 2013. It's called Plan Bay Area, and the most recent iteration is called Plan Bay Area 2040. And this is uh, run through these shadowy organizations, the MTC, that's the Metropolitan uh, 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 Transit uh, 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 Commission and Transportation Commission. I'm sorry, and the uh, ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments. All right, and these are regional planning bodies that are not, um, their membership are not elected. It's composed, in the case of the MTC, it's a bunch of people you don't even know, you never heard of, most likely, unless you're all up in this. In terms of ABAG, it's a bunch of city council people, supervisors, at times mayors and uh, deputy mayors and whatnot, um, who were elected by the people, supposedly elected, selected by the people in their specific municipalities to do one job who have now selected themselves to make decisions for the entire Bay Area. And the budget for that, mm, $300 billion, right? So when we talk about where the money is, right? And a lot of these, here's, the, here's where it really ties into the slow streets thing. A lot of these are, are transportation yeah. related issues. And it's also ties in with the greenwashing. Right, ties in with the greenwashing, right? Because the uh, effective excuse for all this, there was a California Senate bill, I think it was Senate Bill 375, that's looking for a uh, per capita greenhouse gas carbon dioxide uh, reduction, greenhouse gas emission reduction per capita of 15%. So that's their big excuse why they get to do all this stuff. But, you know, I, I, especially when we're talking about, uh, uh, about, um, you know, I, I got to throw this out here because they have this whole bit about equity with this. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so let me give you their demographic projection for between now and uh, 2040. Uh, they say, uh, by 2040, there will be no clear, this is directly out of, their, out of their documents. By 2040, there will be no clear majority or plurality in terms of race, ethnicity, in the Bay Area as population groups, whites, Hispanics, and Asians slash other will account for approximately one third of the region's population. Notice anything missing there? Yeah. They, they, they even a mention of black folk? How about, how about native folk? How about, how about uh, what about, uh, you know, I think I'm pretty sure like Fremont San Leandro area has the largest population of Afghanis outside of the country of Afghanistan. So are they Asian? Are they other? You see what I'm saying? But these are the planning documents with $300 billion with a B behind them. And, 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 and they have to somehow, because we're not supposed to be commenting on this, right? They have to somehow slip in. So they do it incrementally. And that's where you get things like slow streets. That's where you get the clearing of Market Street from, from cars, the, the Bay Rapid Transit, all this mess. But, but one last piece, I know I'm talking too long, so I'll, I'll cut it short. The safety piece, right? Going back to what Brother Gerald was on about, the safety piece. Look, in, the, in these days of COVID-19, there's all this big talk about safety. The fact of the matter is, this country and this Bay Area, this state of California and this Bay Area, has never given two craps about the safety of black people, the safety of brown people, the safety of poor people, the safety of homeless people. So when they're talking about safety, they are talking about a very specific demographic and how they like to feel safe that we, that we pay for with our bodies and our lives. And I'll just, I'll, I'll, leave, it at, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, Amy? Leroy, yeah, I just, I just wanted to say really quickly, because I want to make sure we have time uh, for our beautiful folks who might want to ask questions. Again, shout yeah. out to Weston and Gerald and, um, and I mean, and Jonathan Gomez and some other cats, all beautiful, uh, poor family and poverty scholars and fighters. But I just want to say, the other thing that's going on, family, is the white middle class bike Nazis. Now, um, you might have heard me talk about this, but when, when the people who are quote unquote backing this, um, and even some of them are POC bike folks, but al almost all of them, all the money traces back to um, some of the Northern California Bike Coalition and all those folks 
We know those from Frisco. And I, when I say bike Nazis with three Ks, I ain't even joking because these are white middle-class people who do not want to see poor people who call the cops and the police on houseless people and who specifically have stolen huge swaths of uh, Brown neighborhood, the Mission District, of t the Tenderloin and Market, and who whose goal ultimately is to actually turn, you know, all of California into bike. Well, I, I'm a bike rider, but I don't roll like that. I roll to survive on my bike once in a while, but I don't move like it's my life. You know what I'm saying? And so what I'm getting at is, as all of the guests talked about, safe is just code for they don't got to see poor people and people of color in their own hood. And as Gerald pointed out, it's because, you know, oh, they don't feel safe walking in there. Well, it ain't their neighborhood. They just moved there. You know, it's Fatima's neighborhood. It's the folks like Gerald's neighborhood. It's the Migrante indigenous people who are right here on Black Arthur. It's Homies Empowerment. It's the black owned businesses. It's Fromm's Martial Arts neighborhood. It ain't your neighborhood. It's a Hulu house. That's right. Thank you. And homefulness and on and on. So I say all that to say, let's not get, you know, confused or confused about who's supporting this. And yes, you guys rock. All of you guys laid out really good things. Um, Leroy, let's see if folks in our in our beautiful community have any questions. Okay, so I'm gonna unmute anybody. Please speak one at a time. Okay. All right. Here it goes. Uh, Boom. Okay. Oh, Bilal's there. Hey, what's up, Bilal? I, I've been here. Hey, in the house with Bilal, you have an interesting like screen over you, like you're in a veil. Anyway, okay, let's try to Everybody's on mute, and if people have questions, please ask questions. You know, please don't talk over each other if we can, okay? And try to keep your question to one to two minutes or your comment, and then, yeah, guess we'll respond. Bilal, you want to start? Uh yeah yeah I just i uh, just chiming in so I missed I know some real good stuff because I see some good people on here. Uh that um, I it's probably y'all talked about this and so forth. You know, Gil Scott Heron had a a a a, a thing a song or a poem, and it was called "Ain't No New Thing." I don't know if y'all familiar with that. Ain't no, yeah. ain't no, ain't no new thing. So anyway, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that out front because uh, <laughs> this, this isn't any new thing, right? I right. Mean, what, what's that saying? When America gets a cold, black folks get pneumonia, right? That's right. And poor people. So this ain't no new thing we're going through. I mean, and it's been coming. And a lot of people have been warning us about this. A lot of people have been doing a lot of analysis. <laughs> And, and warn about this was going to happen. So we're, you know, black, brown, poor people generally, when you look at the indexes of the positive, we're, we're at the bottom. And when you look at an index of negative, we're at the top, right? So it ain't no new thing. What has happened, though, it's mutated. Col I call it the colonial virus apocalypse, <laughs> right? Because we know what the real virus has been, it, attacking the membrane and the protective covering of the membrane. We can use, we can use this analogy uh, what's happening with us. But I mean, uh, I want to come in Tiny Poor Magazine and others who have been out there on the front line, who've been out there without any hesitancy serving the people. And that ain't no new thing, because y'all been doing that. Oh. Y'all been doing that. Others on this, I, I don't know who else is on here, but I, I can see some. Jeremy, folks, y'all been y'all been doing this. So y'all setting this this model. The model's been set, and others out there too. I don't want to, you know, neglect others, but y'all, because y'all are most immediate with me, and y'all have set this model. So you know, we're gonna go through this thing, and the virus, once it is contained or uh, defeated or whatever, life as we know it is not going to it's going to be different, a lot different. And that's when the real shit gonna hit. The real colonial virus is gonna mm -hmm. hit. 
because we're going to see a whole alternate how things were before. And I'm not advocating we go back to normalcy because normalcy is what fuck got us in the first place. Mm -hmm. okay. Right? So I ain't into that. We got to get back to normalcy. So we got to get back to uh, 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 the uh, uh, race, racist environmentalism, right? Classism and all these things that are now exacerbating this virus. We want to go back to that. That's why I trip on people. I want to get back to normal. Get, you know, I, I'm not hearing that. But uh, I'm just saying that I really commend y'all what y'all doing. You set the model because now we know the causes of why we're disproportionately impacted. We know this. We've been talking about this for years. We've been telling these motherfuckers for years. We've been telling these motherfuckers, homeless people, according to you and I, uh, human rights, have to have access to water. We've been telling them that all this time, right? So I'm, it's a trip how people all know surprise. They really how people surprise. Oh, black people being disproportionately uh, impacted. Well, what the fuck y'all been? You know what I'm saying? Where the fuck these people been? You know, of course we're gonna be disproportionately. Then y'all gonna come and lie on us and put this bullshit out as we're going around to tell black folks is immune to it. So we get a call. That's our goddamn problem. It ain't the government or capitalism. But anyway, we know as y'all say, capitalism. I'm ranting right now, but. I'm looking at what do we do once this thing has is in its particular form now. Once it has, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm looking for the word is not completely over because we're going to still be in the colonial virus. But once it has stopped, then what? Because the things are going to be fucking changing. So you know, I'm just saying, well, the existing paradigm that we've been struggling against will it be fundamentally uh, altered? Or will this be this parody continuing a new form, which will lead the masses of us worse off than we was before? And I think these these are questions, discussions we should be having. I mean, I'm not gonna keep harping on what caused this and the impact of it. We know that we've been saying that. What's gonna happen now afterwards? Because we definitely can't go back to normal. Okay, man. Yeah. So I'm just saying that some of the stuff y'all been doing. Uh, and I, you know, as part of that, but the shit y'all been doing, this sets up a model on where we need to go. And I want people to understand that. And I'm telling people that out there, uh, you want to look at a model, look at Poor Magazine. They've already been doing these things. And of course they on the front line out there. But of course, once this thing is over, then what? And these people have set a model. So y'all, y'all, y'all have, y'all have done that. I have to go back to work tomorrow. I've been quarantined uh, 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 for a month. I didn't have it, but my partner was so worried about me because of my age and some underlying conditions I have and not her getting it. And I don't want her to get it. She shut my ass down before the governor did. So uh, <laughs> I'm going I'm going to go back to work. I call, I sent my job. I work at Bay Area Community Service Outreach Coordinating. So we, you know, I let them know I'll be back May 6th. And I was informed that your your employment slot will not be there that long. You're gonna have to reapply for that slot when it opens, right? Mm. So I've been corresponding mm. all this time with HR and my immediate supervisor, and I was letting them know, like, hey, wait a minute, let me get a hold of HR because last thing I got, even from the executive director, Bilal, take as much time as you need. And then I understand there's a 90 day moratorium on laying people off or whatever, right? So I had to get back to them. So they said, can you come in Monday? Yeah. So they were talking about the protocols because I work out of a navigation center in Berkeley at the STAIRS program. We do, I'm the outreach coordinator. But I will be locked down. And we've had, what I understand, we had one of our people in there uh, who contacted it, but they've been taken to another place. So okay, we'll doing, uh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll be doing the testing. Mm -hmm. So my question again, I'm sorry. My question is again, if y'all haven't talked about this already and haven't been talking about this, my question is, what is life going to look like after this thing is gone, especially for us? Because everything is going to be altered, and it's only going to get worse. The virus is one thing, but what's going to happen after the aftermath, it, the uh, consequences, what we need to talk about that, ask that question. Okay, thank you. Elion, you, you had your hand up. You, you know, his question is an important question. I, I really like the fact that he 
he expressed, we should have no desire to go back to normal, that normal was the problem. Mm. But I, I like to think of big problems in small chunks, okay? Mm. So while we have this time and we're together, I want to make sure everybody considers this. Don't be part of the second surge. Mm. You have to understand you're in a place that does not value you. What do capitalist systems have a lot of in need, but find totally disposable, poor people. Mm. They don't care if we all die. That's we right. breed at a higher rate. Like Jesus said, the poor will always be with us. You have to understand that capitalism needs to create new markets. America's pretty fished out, okay? So when you think about the people who are the most endangered, you have to understand this country does not care if every single unhoused person dies if every poor black and brown person dies then like he's what, what would the brother say you don't even appear in the 2040 plan okay you have to listen carefully to what they did tell you this has never been about trying to find a way to keep people alive it was to prepare medical systems for the search mm. to be able to deal with the capacity them people telling that brother he need to get back to work or he ain't got no job. He's going to help decide what comes next. If you let capitalism kill you, right. then you won't be in what happens next. So I tell, I, I, I highly suggest that we use common sense along with science and not listen to people who do not care whether we live or die mm, and take right. the extra time to strengthen systems so that we can support ourselves. We need new jobs, new services, and new ways to pay for them. This is one in a chronicle of events. You talked about from Katrina to now. Don't, don't forget what happened in 2008, 2009. That was the greatest transference of black wealth in modern history. That's right. That black wealth, that's, that, that theft of black wealth is, is directly connected to our brothers and sisters sleeping on the street. That's right. If they're dead, they're no longer a problem. So don't be part of the second wave. And if, if you, ever, ever, ever thought that you might have the courage to cut the cord, now is the time to do it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Any, anybody else have questions? We only have about two minutes. Uh, anyone want to chime in, say anything? Last comment, Jonathan or Weston or any of those beautiful cats out there? Otherwise, we're going to close it. I, there's a person here from Fremont, Blair B. Can I speak for a second? Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah you. go ahead. Hi, I've always enjoyed uh, the Poor News Network uh, when I hear it on KPFA, and uh, I just wanted to thank you for your work. Thank you for this webinar. Uh, I, I'm from San Jose, and I, I've been trying for like years to try to understand there's new accountability with technology issues, hmm. and it's really, it's really important work about sustainability. And I really liked the, the last woman's uh, comments about uh, trying to, uh, you know, they're doing uh, like, like emergency preparedness stuff. And I think, uh, I don't know, to counter it, there has to be a way to counter it. And I think that is really asking and demanding for good sustainability practices. So I'm coming on from the total life affirming, how to practice that with your government life affirming. So I'm a little bit uh, lame, but, you know, I've been learning that, you know, for all the slow street stuff, it's gonna have an awful lot of technology and surveillance on those streets and really ask and demand for uh, minimal practices. You can do that. And I know that, uh, you know, the Oakland's got the Privacy Advocacy Committee, if you can work with them or commission and, uh, you know, uh, really ask and demand for minimal practices along the streets, uh, minimal technology and surveillance along the streets. Uh, make demands of the MTC. I'll, I'm about finished here. The person who spoke about the MTC, that was awesome. They're not, they're very smart and intelligent and they're male. It's a male-oriented group, I'm, I'm understanding. But they don't quite have uh, a good feel for like what the other person said. They, they lack something. And, you know, to learn to talk to them and just really 
give them what's needed. That's that's the conundrum we're all always facing. And uh, you know, I, I think you could help them a lot. And I don't know what else uh, to offer. We have the same problem in San Jose. Uh, west side of San Jose wants to gentrify East San Jose with bicycle stuff, and East San Jose is 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 you know wary to do that. But that still might be happening anyway. And and I like the the. I don't quite use the term bike Nazi, but I totally have those same feelings. And uh, it's they, they, they are the kind of people who want tons of surveillance and technology <laughs> on the streets. And uh, that's, that's part of their vision and that's hurtful. Yeah. They call that civil rights and civil protections yeah. when it's actually, you know, it's, it's invasive. Yeah. And uh, so that's about it for me. And uh, thanks for all your work and, uh, and, and you really helped me a lot, uh, helped out me a lot today. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to say really quickly, because I want to make sure that, again, that people heard the call from Gerald, and um, and we also have a really just thank you, by the way, from San Jose for that was beautiful. Um, I just want to say that um, one of the thoughts that were coming since we've been thinking about this as poor people, we had the, when we first got to homefulness, we actually did this thing called the ghetto ride. Um, because a lot of poor people don't even use bicycles and we should, um, it saved my life. You know, literally I call it my bike ride for sanity. I got a hoopty bike and I just learned as an adult and I got on it every day. And that's how I'm staying alive in this moment. Cause I'm definitely being triggered as a, a poor person in all kinds of ways. I say all that to say that there's some other POC and poor people bike riders. And I think that actually the way to respond to this might be a, a combination of art and organizing that Gerald supplied. So we do kind of like a socially distant bike ride of POC indigenous bike riders to City Hall to in all of these cities, you know, from Frisco to San Jose, uh, because guess what? We out here too. There's the Black, <laughs> bike rider, Black Bike Rider Coalition. There's all kinds of, hey Delphine, much love. And there's some powerful poor people bike riders. But we just don't move the same way. We don't move with no humility. We don't move like Nazis, right? So I just want to say that to say that um, we're going to be putting out some ideas. Um, if people are interested in supporting these in your area because we're running out of time, can you email, and I'm going to put it in the chat, uh, poormag at gmail.com because I think the other important thing, as uh, Iodeli says, is don't be part of the surge. And like uh, Bilal said, let's make our own you know, as we do here at Poor, at Poor Magazine and, uh, you know, and the beautiful folks at Sacramento, uh, Sac Soup and the, the cats that roll with, uh, you know, uh, Delphine and all a lot of you, right? We're, we're liberators. Um, the beautiful work that Iodeli does and all of the work that Gerald does. So I'm going to put that email and I'd like you guys all to email in. Um, Delphine, if you want to throw in a, a real quick message about the powerful cats from Sac that you work with. Thank you, Tiny. Um, well, I, I can just say that we are still struggling to get the, the very basics um, to the folks who need it most urgently. Um, the hotel rooms, the, the cabins, the trailers that were promised weeks and weeks ago right. have yet to be delivered here in Sacramento, and that's a huge problem. Right. And um, we do have, we do have a, a group of, of medical students volunteering there who are doing wonderful work. Um, and starting to do some testing and, and some, some uh, monitoring of, of symptoms, but the, the, most, the most needed um, forms of, of resources are still, um, are still needed urgently. And who, and could you put a, put your website or how people can support on the chat right now? People support sure. the work of, yeah, of you guys, beautiful. Yes, we're called the Sacramento. Uh, in, we're called Sacramento in solidarity with unhoused people, Sac Soup, and that's a coalition supporting the Sacramento Homeless Union. Right on. Thank right you. On. Right on. All right, folks. So we're gonna we're out of time. I just want to thank these beautiful liberators and revolutionaries, Iodeli Wordslanger, uh, right. beautiful Gerald Smith, all of your work, um, beautiful Jerry, Jer Jeremy Miller from Poor Magazine, um, all you all, all you all. Uh, this is also liberation right here. We're gonna be uh, coming back next Sunday uh, with the Plantation Prison Insider Report. 
uh, with both Minister King William and Joey Villarreal, both who did uh, decades of their life inside the plantation prison system. You know, for us at Poor Magazine, it's about poor people speaking for ourselves. Um, and we love all the prison activists and all that, but we also want to hear and have it led by people who are inside and who come out of that plantation. So tune in next Sunday for From Katrina to Corona uh, with um, some powerful plantation prison scholars. We'll keep this dialogue going. And in the meantime, please send your info in to poormag at gmail.com so we can actually activate against this fake ass, not really slow, Bike Nazi streets, just saying. Leroy, close out, right? Okay, just saying, you know, peace and love, you know, keep up the fight, and stay tuned for Poor Magazine. More programs to come. All right. Thanks, everybody. Love. Power to the people! Power to the people! Power to the people. 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 Power